Okay, beloved, we're going to go through this book again called Camta. I'm going to skim through some uh, things I highlighted in here that it's very important for you to understand about shamanic practices and how it is the foundation is also the foundation to indeed the spiritual practice. I wanted to come here and share this with you so you can get a more of a broader understanding of shamanic spiritual practices and an idea of how you can implement it in your everyday practices. Uh, this book is by Derek Moore. I went through this book with you before, um, but I didn't, I didn't give a review, a detailed review like I am now on this book. And it deserves a detailed review because this is a uh, this is comedic shamanism and this uh, God, this author is sharing his uh, shamanic practice and how it works for him. He's sharing it with us. And so I'm going to move forward here and go through some things that I've highlighted here. I felt that's going to be important uh, for you in understanding more about, about shamanism that's the core of your practice there okay let me move through here I'm going through the highlighted areas and again you can find this book on Amazon that's where I found it okay what is Kappa? Kanta it, it is a comedic shamanic spiritual tradition that draws heavily on comedic spirituality and the remnants of Bantu Congo philosophy that survived slavery in North America. Kanta is not rec is not the recreation, reconstruction, or resurrection of comedic religion because the comedic religion was created for ancient African agrarian who lived in the desert alongside the Nile and was governed by a king and queen. In other words, the comedic religion is not relevant to our situation. However, the concepts and principles of comedic religion, which can be found in all indigenous African derived spiritual systems are by using the concepts and principles, combining them with the surviving Bantu Congo philosophy, we have Kamta, a spiritual system that allows anyone to tap into the spiritual realm or assistance. Metaphysically speaking, we say Kamta in all caps when referring to black lands as an Afrocentric reference to the ancestors of comedic people, the Kushites, ancient Nubians, the ancestors of African American South, and the spiritual world, worlds, which is imagined to be dark, hidden, and invisible. Kamta is the dark side, but it has nothing to do with morals. It is a metaphorical allusion to the richness of the spiritual realm of the kingdom of Osar and the deepest parts of our mind. So that is what he's referring to when he talks about Kat, Kamta. Okay, let's move on here. And this book is about 205 pages. It's, I think it's good all the way through. You know, a lot of this stuff didn't relate to me, but there is a lot of gems in here that I'm sharing with you today. Okay, spiritual development. Therefore, spiritual development has nothing to do with being good or bad. It is about learning how to discipline one's mind to acquire raw power, which he calls light power, uh, soul power. From the comedic perspective, one reason, reasons our current societies are collapsing it's not because there are not enough good people in the world. It is because there is a severe shortage of spiritual power. I remember when I used to be in sales, selling security systems, there was a static we used in the quote, which was 90% of the people believe in doing good. But when these same people were put into the dire circumstance and a compromised situation, they will break the law. In other words, most people know that it's wrong to be to steal, but if, they're desperately hungry, a man in a situation where he can steal food, he will. Why? It's simply because he's hungry. 
okay? Hunger has consumed his rational thinking. It has nothing to do with his morals. The reason question is why is he hungry? How did the individual get into the predicament? If we fix what got him into the situation in the first place, we not only have prevented an individual from uh, being incarcerated because they had no food to eat, we also improved society by investing in the mental, spiritual well-being of the individual. You see, we're missing that component here today. We're missing that component here today. This is what comedic shamanism focuses on. No, it is not about being good because good people get taken advantage of all the time. We hear and see it on the radio, TV, internet, etc. The world is full of people. In fact, there is a limited amount of good people. What the world lacks is powerful people. Powerful people, people that's tapping into that power. There is a limited amount of power. There is a limited amount of power. So the comedic tradition focuses on disciplining one's mind in order to acquire more raw power. The more one one's mind is disciplined, the more raw power they can acquire and use to make things happen. To help us in acquiring more raw power, we work with two spiritual beings, the Nectaru, which is the guardian spirit, and the Akahu, ancestors and spirit guides. The Nectaru are believed to be the first individuals to have disciplined their mind and acquired raw power. Below is a listing of the ne Nectaru from the most disciplined to the least disciplined. So he lists that here. Okay, he has Osar, Dahudi, Sokar, Mayat, Hiru, Akahudi, Hiru, Nebhet, and Anubis. So he has a few here that's listed here. And again, he's working with the comedic Pathanon here. That's what he's working with. You may work with something else. But shamanism, what I like about shamanism that you can tweak it to your own needs, to what works for you. And he talks about, he just talked about that in this book. Let's go on, divination. Divination is not used to predict the future, but to inform us of what could, would occur if we choose to be reactive instead of proactive. In other words, divination is used to inform us of what is most, like, most likely to occur if we do not do anything to change a current situation. When I say my readings are for healing, the reading won't change in what until you change. There are many forms of divination that are and can be used, including dreams, visions, omens, signs, oracles. For more information on simple and easy to use oracles without all the religious dogma associated with divination, uh, see the Ma Guide to Comedic Way of Personal Transformation. That might be in this book. Attuning your, your energy through holistic living. This is how you attune your energy. This is how you get in alignment with those universal energy so you can see changes. Finally, it is very important that to progress spiritually, you should attune your energy, adopting a holistic lifestyle, a healing lifestyle. It's holistic. Before we begin, we must recognize that the reason most diets fail is not because they do not work. Most diets fail because most people do not understand what a lifestyle change means. You don't understand that. For instance, if you decide to go on a high protein, low complex carbohydrate diet, you need to be prepared to do this for the rest of your life. If you decide to exercise 30 minutes to an hour to be healthier, then this means you must prepare to do this for the rest of your life. This is what lifestyle change means. But most people, when they go on a diet, only do it for a specific time frame and this is the reason it does not work it must be a way of life that's why healing don't work for people they don't make it a way of life they think it's something they can put on the shelf and bring it down whenever they want to they think spiritual development is something you can put on the shelf and bring it down when you want to 
I mean, I was surprised after COVID. I looked on the internet and everybody was doing tarot reading. I said, what in the world is going on here? What's going on here? It, show, it, it sure pushed people to get spiritual. I seen people uh, doing tarot and I, I had so many questions behind that. To live holistically, you have to be committed to living this way for the rest of your life. You say no drive by. We got a lot of people in here in for the fad of things because it look fashionable. We got a lot of people wearing all this, um, wearing all these crystals and all this stuff for aesthetic. And they they bombarded with all these different energies. And I'm like, oh my God, they, they're working with so many energies right now. How would they know when their own energy is at play? How would they know if this crystal is actually doing what it's doing? Because you got so many other crystals on top of these crystals. It became, this has became an aesthetic. And I'm like, you know, is the work really being done here? This is the reason I do not promote any type of lifestyle such as vegan, vegetarian lifestyle. Because if vegan or vegetarian finds themselves in a food desert where they cannot get adequate amount of produce or vegetable, proteins many vegans or vegetarians will consume junk food potato chips chocolate etc all because because it is still vegetable i have known many vegetarians and vegans vegans who are not who were unhealthier than meat eaters because they do not understand what holistic lifestyle means How many of you understand what that means? This is a way of life, not to go watch a whole bunch of videos and say, I'm going to learn this. How are you applying it? How are you applying this information to your life? How is it enhance, enhancing your life? So holistic first and foremost means listening to your body's needs. For some, they may need to consume more vegetables. For others, they may need to consume more proteins, while others may need to do both as well as exercise, do meditative exercises and meditate and so on. Now, contrary to popular beliefs, holistic living doesn't, doesn't mean becoming a vegetarian or a vegan. It doesn't mean that. That's what you see in here being, you know, being promoted. By the way, you do not have to have, have to be a vegetarian or vegan to be spiritual. I learned this in metaphysical school because this was a topic that came up in in metaphysical school when I was in college. They, we talked about this very thing. The body knows what it needs. If it needs meat, then it needs meat. If it needs vegetables, then it, it will tell you what it needs. Again, we go through these extremes. Another misnomer is that humans beings are not natural herbivores vegetarians carnivores meat eaters omnivores this basically means that human beings can survive eating plants or animals if you follow the evolution of species human beings had to adapt to all types of climatic differences which is why human beings can be found to this day consuming everything so let's discuss cuisine in my personal research as I overcame my dis-ease, he, and he, he, he describes it just like I described, it is a dis-ease in your body. I learned that it is a myth that African-American diet was a very poor diet due to slavery. Slaves were considered a commodity. No, the, no, the enslaved Africans did not have the best quality of food, but it was not the worst. Slave owners, per Dr. Frederick Opie, author of Hogs and Harmony, Soul food from Africa to the Americas tried, tried to reproduce African food stuff in the cheapest manner possible. The poorest quality of food could not provide the nourishment or energy needed for, the, for people who burned on an average 2,000 plus calories a day. In other words, the slave owners had to give the enslaved Africans decent provisions to ensure that they were healthy to work the plantation. In some regions, the enslaved Africans could have plots of land to grow their own food, while others were given certain provisions and supplemented their diet by hunting and fishing. Slaves were responsible for providing food 
everyone providing food, everyone included themselves and their slave owners. Okay, so it is telling you there they had a variety of food. Okay, let me move on. Special movements to manipulate energy. You'll see that a lot. I go through a lot of that uh, when I before I even begin a meditation. Uh, I get my altar going and I'll just start playing music to move through. My, my, I have my own playlist that get, gets, my, gets me uplifted, that gets my energy going, gets my momentum going. To manipulate how energy flows, certain gestures can be used to place protective energy within things and expel energy. For in, instance, many uh, spiritual healers will cleanse their homes by burning a heavy incense, opening all the windows or use a brand new broom to beat the walls with a strong, fragrant, herbal bath. Both gestures are done to symbolize chasing energy out of the dwelling. I remember when, uh, before I left my ex-husband, I saw this stuff on the wall. He, he loved this room. This was his man cave. And I didn't want to really uh, smoke in the house. He smoked in the house. I didn't like smoking in the house. And you could just see this stuff sitting on the walls and I can just feel the energy in there with the thoughts and smoke mixed together and I began to beat the walls with the broom and you can see the stuff coming off the wall but I needed more help I needed a, a pressure washer to get that stuff off the walls and I, I stopped sitting in that room because of that okay because I was trying to chase that energy away well, is that you can feel it when you walk in this room in that room I stopped sitting in there to make use of special movements is the best it is best that you familiar familiarize yourself with your own gestures and symbolic meanings observe your daily routines your actions and how you go about doing things here are a few common gestures that will be used throughout the book knocking three times on the floor the altar or imaginary crossroad for the may -onk. Okay, so you've heard you, you tap on the altar three times to call on your ancestors or your spirit guides. Since things grow from the bottom up to attract something to you, you move, you move the feet, feet to head. And I tell people to do that when they to, uh, do spiritual baths too. If you want to draw something to you, you need to wash from your feet to your head if you want to draw something to you. If you want to remove something after you, you want to move down. Down. If you're doing a bath to remove negativity, you want to wash down. I talked about this in my, uh, I think in one of my spiritual bath videos. But yeah, you want to wash down. You'll see that in hoodoo too. They'll tell you in hoodoo. If you want something to come near you, then you fold that paper near you. If you want something to go away from you, you fold it away from you. Same concept here. To bless candles to attract something, a north from the base to the wick. To repel, turn the candle upside down and bite or break the wick in. Then anoint from the old wick to the base. Light the base in. You know, that some people, uh, they'll go to the other end of the candle. I've seen that too when you're doing reversal work, working with reversal candles. They'll cut one side of the wick, wick off and work it out that way. Folding arms and crossing legs is a gesture symbolizing closing oneself off from receiving energy. So these are little simple things that we do, you know, and we're probably not even aware of that we do it. But I try to be, I'm try to be aware of that, especially during meditation, the crossing of my arms and legs. Because again, you're crossing over energy, you're blocking energy. These are little simple things we do to manipulate energy or to protect ourselves from negative energy. Okay, negative energy can be dispelled by subtly clapping your hands three times while calling upon the spirits out loud. You can do that. If you don't have sage sometime and you know it's just too quiet in the house and it's too thick, it's quiet and thick to you, you can clap your hands three times and that energy will start to break up in the atmosphere. It will start to break up that energy, all that thick energy that's in the atmosphere. Positive spirits 
believed to rest on the right shoulder while the negative spirits parade on the left. More will be said about this in the future. This is just the meaning behind throwing salt over your left shoulder. Disposing of ritual items and offerings, not looking back, symbolizing putting a matter in your sub superconscious spirit's hand. And they tell you to go to the crossroads, put that back and don't look back. That means yeah, you, it's already taken care of. Your superconscious is already taken care of. Who is in the superconscious? Those collective ancestors. Again, everything is consciousness. Sucking and pulling motions with your hands are used to draw energy out of something. You will see that in shamanic practicing when they're removing attachments. You'll see them uh, moving a dis-ease that's, common, that's commonly seen in shamanic practices when they're doing healing work. Cutting and hacking movements are used to cut, cut binds. So all these movements mean something. The most widely used special movement in this book is drawing of the Ma'ank discussed in lesson two. Chanting and tearing. Now, I experienced what he was talking about in the church because if you begin to chant these words long enough, you will start speaking another language because you have tapped in to another part of your mind. I remember when I was younger, I went to church to get the Holy Ghost. We were told to repeat the words hallelujah or thank you, Jesus. And to the Holy Ghost, mediumistic tra trans state, guess what, what happens, falls on us. See, we still do this same thing in church. And they do this same thing in DJ spiritual practices. They call the tarian for the Holy Spirit. That's what they call it. You will go in a tear room and you will constantly keep saying these mantras over and over again until the Holy Spirit fell on you and you start speaking in tongues. What are the tongues? These are our ancestors coming through a type of possession. It's the same thing. We've been bamboozled that it's evil, but you're doing the same thing when you shout and get the Holy Ghost and all of the church. You are being possessed by the ancestral spirits. Nothing different here. I remember being told that the reason this works was because of the power in the name of Jesus. Later, as I learned more about Ba's superconsciousness and Sahu's subconscious, I found that anything repeated causes the Sahu to go into an autopilot and gives us access to our Ba. That's what mantras do. See, they're practicing the same thing. The same thing. But see, Christians, they have not unpacked they, they know the religion, but they do not know, understand spirituality, the science of spirituality. And so now they're calling it e evil, but I, we're unpacking it here. In other words, any word or name said re repeatedly, repetitively can lead to an altered state of consciousness. However, some words are better at producing a trans state because are based on sound. For instance, the power hallelujah, which is the reason for Rastafarian's favorite this at the name of God, but any name can be used. Okay, so you seeing it there, you seeing how your mind works. This is all about tapping into your mind, into that consciousness. Again, you are your ancestors. Your ancestors are you, and you are able to tap into that collectively through your mind. Okay, I'm moving on here. Okay, I'm going to go to ritual, even though I didn't, you know, I didn't, I didn't uh, highlight this, but I, I don't want to skip it. A ritual is basically an organized ceremony to achieve a desired result, either planting positive energy or removing negative energy. A shamanic ritual may include prayer, meditation, special movements. Like I said, dancing. I like to dance. I like to get that energy flowing. That's a, another way our ancestors tapped into energy by dancing. You need to be moving, moving that energy along or moving that energy out. Rituals are typically performed once a day, week, month, 
and annually. There are numerous rituals that can be performed because shamanism focuses on maintaining and restoring wholeness. All rituals should be planned in the beginning. Rituals should always begin with a prayer to incorporate assistance from your spirits, followed by prayer of what you specifically want to accomplish. Next, follow your intuition. Please note the Bolivian spirits will never inspire you to compromise your principles by harm, by harm yourself or others. Finally, close the ritual by saying thanks. For instance, a simple house cleansing ritual involves pouring a cap of ammonia, a cap of vinegar, or Florida water into a bucket of water. Take a new mop and mop the corners from top to bottom to remove negative influences. Make sure that you move in a clockwise direction towards your front door as if you're chasing someone out of your home. Flush the mop water in the toilet. Afterwards, moving in a clockwise wise motion beginning the front door and sprinkle or spray sprinkle or spray fragrances in your corner from the floor to the ceiling for instance cinnamon for love and money lavender for tranquility etc okay these are like i said these are shamanistic these are shamanistic practices this is something that our ancestors have been doing from the beginning of time this is the basic foundation and core to where you will move into. Human beings have a bad habit of abusing, misusing, and neglecting anything that is freely received and not earned. And they do. We do. I cannot tell you uh, the amount of people that come into my inbox wanting stuff. And it's just draining. It is just draining. And what I've seen, there is a lot of parasitic people out here. Whether they know they're parasites or not, you know, I'm not sure. But a lot of people that yeah, you'll see those monitoring spirits, those parasitic spirits, they always want something for free. They want you to give, 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 but they do not support. They do not support. That's another thing. They don't support. They want, they are benefiting off people giving them things for free. That's parasitic. Okay, that is very parasitic. And then you have the monitoring spirits. They don't particularly like you. But they can't stop watching you because what you have is, is, a. Uh, is a value, but they don't like you. They just want to watch what you're doing, maybe uh, copy what you're doing, but they don't particularly like you or support you. These are parasitic spirits, which I'll talk about. I'm going to go into that probably in another video, but those are parasitic spirits. I get them in my inbox all the time. They want to have long conversations with me. They never really support it. They, they're not really supporters. You know, they don't support what I have going on. They never support, you know, but they want me to give so much of my energy and attention to them. They don't buy any of my products. They don't, you know, uh, buy any of my services, but they're in my inbox. And I've had some to just outright ask me for a free reading. Yeah. Fasting or sacrificing. Although aesthetics, aesthetics have made fasting to be extreme spiritual practice, the purpose of fasting is to make a sacrifice. A sacrifice means that you give up something physical in return for something spiritual, for something spiritual blessing. We fast for various reasons. For instance, if a person truly wants to lose excessive fat, it is suggested they fast on sugar, carbohydrates for a period. During this time, their spirits will give them insight on how to accomplish their goal, to improve relations between you and someone. Fast to not get hungry while talking with them. I mean, fast to not get angry. Oh, I'm sorry. Fast to not get angry while talking with them. Fasting usually requires giving up something that you are in the habit of doing. 
you can fast on food, drink, sex. Okay, back to it. So you can fast off sex, actions, behaviors, television, or any activity. You can even fast by saying that every time you do something, you will give up money, such as a swear jar, jar but instead of a dollar. Try giving up $5. Again, the psycho spiritual purpose is that you are sacrificing something you like and enjoy for something you need. Okay? So you can do that as well to draw on spiritual power. Affirmation, declaration, glyphs, and seagulls. Okay? He said, I'm going to make this section short and sweet because there is a growing group of people that comes from a strong religious background, trying to convince people that the 42 laws of Maya should be committed to memory, recited and followed like the 10 commandments. This is totally untrue. The 42 laws of Maya are declarations, which is a powerful, which is a powerful that you are emphatically say out loud, unlike affirmations, which state a goal has already happened, which your Sahu superconscious fights against because it's fe it feels true. A declaration sends a powerful message to the universe, and Bob, which is the superconscious, and Sahu parts of your being of a goal you want to achieve. In other words, most affirmations do not work because they lack feeling and without feeling. It is difficult to convince your sahu to assist you. Declarations are a better choice, but the problem with reciting the 42 laws of Maya is that we do not live in ancient Kemet. So many of these declarations are irrelevant. Remember the Kemetic people were again, were agrarian society. Most of us today do not know how to grow garlic, not to mention anything else that is agricult agriculturally related. But then, you know, that's changing. A lot of us are getting back into growing things. Okay, so I'm gonna move on from there. And this is the highlighted area I have here. There are several ways you can enter into a trans state, such as through meditating, chanting, fasting, dancing, around for hours until you become exhausted using illicit drugs i hate to say that i don't like to say that using psychoactive substances i would like to say that uh which is common in many shamanic practices like i said ayahuasca using those psychedelic uh substances have you uh have yield great results for people please don't dismiss that that can uh put you on the fast track to your healing if that's something that you're thinking about sex and masturbation however let me explain why i favor the last option over all the rest he favors uh sex and masturbation and we've heard of people being able to use the power of sex or their orgasm to charge things he says, meditation, meditation, chanting, dancing until you are completely exhausted and fasted takes an enormous amount of time to help you enter a trans state. For the record, they are effective, but personally, I find meditating, dancing around for hours, chanting or fasting for hours or days for boost in sales a little ridiculous. It could be, it could be exhausting to do those things. There's other ways to do it. Although many shamanic societies use drugs like Yehimbi, marijuana, which I talked about cannabis. I talked about how to use cannabis to go into trance-like states and to visit these other realms. I've talked about that. I don't know if I still have the video up here. Uh, alcohol, et cetera, to help facilitate trans states. These people have a different culture appreciation and understanding for the herbal drugs than those of us living in the instant gratifying Western societies. When drugs are used in the West, most focus on the effect and not the intent. 
which results in becoming sleepy, dim-witted, hyperactive, loopy, distracted from their objective. This is the reason I strongly advise against using any drugs of any kind for spiritual purposes. And you have a lot of them that say that. Sex and masturbation are safer choices because they are better controlled, but unless your partner is willing to assist you in deferring your glyph or seagull, seagull, I recommend that sexual intercourse be used only by husband and wife because they are committed to each other's development or should be. They will help each remember the purpose of the ritual. Then one night stands does. Okay, you hear any here? This is because the union between husband and wife is not just for pro procreation, but for spiritual creation. This is one reason why we do not need to be interfacing with the XY chromosome until he understands that. Until he understands how this works, we should not be interfacing them. A lot of them have not made it to this to this level. Between masculine and feminine forces, Shu and Tefnu, Geb and Nut, Yin and Yang, or Yang and Yin. That being said, masturbation is safer and better choice for assisting in trans for firing glyphs and sigils because you are able to exercise more control and discipline. Okay, so you know, a lot of people that are into using a sexual energy for spiritual purpose, you'll see a lot of uh, solitaire uh, pract practitioners use that. Okay, it's just not one of my go-tos. I, I don't use uh, my energy that way. Uh, I haven't used my energy that way. I go a different route. I like doing journey work. I like meditating. I like the a combination of singing and sound to go into those trance states. I also use a herbal. I use a herbal psychoactive option. Okay. Whatever works for you. Okay. Going down to the other parts. Like I said, this book is 205 pages. He covers a lot of information with working with the Egyptian Pantheon and uh, explaining how his, how his spiritual system works. Okay, what are spirits? What are spirits? Because we need to really understand what spirits are and what you've been told and how you would identify them if you're working with them. Spiritual forces of spirits are basically the surviving consciousness of people who died in reasonable manner. Did you hear that? Surviving consciousness, because that's what you're tapping into when you go into your mind and you talking to them. The spirit's going to speak to you in your mind, mostly clairaudient or through images in your mind. Spirits are thinking and rational enti entities that are capable of existing without a physical body. In other words, spirits are basically another word for energy. To distinguish between the Bolivian spirits and Bolivian spirits, people in the Middle Ages began calling Bolivian spirits that assist in clear energy angels. Then they called Bolivian spirits that block, hinder, obstruct, obstruct energy demons in the Judeo-Christian tradition. All spirits are minor animations of our perfect creator, the supreme being who is called in Kemet, uh, Nature, Nebuchadnezzar, the Lord of all things. The one thing that people need to understand about our perfect creator is that the Nebuchadnezzar is an infinitely wise, intelligent, supreme spirit. As with people, when our perfect creator is called upon unexpectedly, our perfect creator may be busy doing something else in our universe or some other universe. Therefore, the supreme being created minor spirits to assist when the divine is busy by taking in upon themselves to render help when 
our perfect creator is called upon. So you'll see that in the laws. They talk about that in Vudum when they talk about the laws. And then you'll have the uh, the Orisha. They say the same thing. You see this common thread that we have? They say that in Ifa too, in Yoruba too, that the one God is bu busy and that we have these lower gods that can assist us. They're in nature, around us, and inside of us too. You'll hear that. This is the only way our perfect creator can address all the petitions and requests that come to the divine from all over the world. There are a countless number of spirits, but there are a select few who assist us in our life. Since Nebuchadnezzar, our perfect creator gives us the freedom to choose the life we are going to live. We each have helping spirits, guardian spirits, and false spirits. How did this happen? Well, very briefly, because this story will be covered in detail in the near future. According to the comedic tradition, there are two brothers named Osar and Set who were given the power to rule of Kevin in the pre-dynastic times. I'm not going to go into that. During this time, the comedic people were in a constant state of war with each other, with one another. Okay, so I'm not going to go into that because to go into that, I have to go into another thing. So I'm just going to stop right there and go on in this book. Our Osar, who is the primary guardian spirit, what are helping spirits? Our Osar, who is our primary helping, uh, primary guardian spirit, is a, accompanied by Bolivian spirits, so called good spirits, good angels, which are deceased people who have seen. Who, who after seeing their life flash before their eyes and realizing how they could have done things differently, choose to correct the mistakes by offering constructive advice, empowering suggestions, assistance, blessings, healings, and protection. So you see how the uh, ancestors can go to the angelic realm. And I, I was explained this when I worked with angels for a long time. They was like, yeah. Like you have ancestors here with us now that's working with us to help you. And we need you to start working with your ancestors. And little did I know when I started working with my ancestors, that's when the real healing work began. Basically, these are the souls of people who exist as spirit, as a spirit now, that agree to assist us in becoming the creators of our own destinies and masters of our own fate. It is similar to the elder instructing a child on the mistakes they made in life. Remember when I told you the divine mother come through, those ancient mothers come through and, and was speaking to me and talking to me and showing me some of the mistakes so that the child will avoid certain pitfalls. Many of these spirits are our deceased blood relatives, but not all of them, which is why they are called helping spirits or Akhu. Akhu is the comedic language means stars. Like I said, we are a star. I say you have those star ancestors. Remember me talking about those star ancestors? Stars were used by ancient people to help them to navigate through the world. Therefore, Akhu are basically helping spirits or guides, although most people refer to these spirits as angels. Are you hearing it here? Technically speaking, the Akhu are our ancestors and spirit guides. So as a shaman, you're going to come in contact with these spirit guides, these helping spirits, these ancestral spirits. The title of Aku is used to describe ancestral spirits, spirit guides, because they were seen as people who had a positive, inspiring influence on our Sahu subconscious, while alive, continue to inspire us after their physical death. Aku are all focused on evolution, spiritual development, etc., of the family, community, group, society, nation, even the world. And this is the difference between the Bolivian and Malivian spirits. Okay, are we understanding there? Akhu are the greatest spiritual allies because they provide us with courage, protection, vision into the great unknown. They offer us insight about their lives, which can aid and ease us 
of some of the setbacks we encounter due to human experience. In other words, they provide us with the map we need whenever we feel lost. Remember, they lived on earth before, so they know of the hardships that we have to face. By assisting us, they help us to advance. But through us, they also are able to spiritually grow as well. This is a twofold thing when we work with ancestors. Okay? So now what you know what that is, when you're working with the most elevated, highest ancestors, you are working with those angelic ancestors. He confirms everything I said, what the ancestors have told me, what the angels have told me before I even read this. It's funny how they tell me things and then I run into it. I'm like, wow, that was right. So again, trusting my own intuition, uh, trusting my own spirit guides, and then reading the material. You know, that's how my, my spirits deal with me. They like telling me stuff. And then they have me go out and test it and read and find information. I'd be like, wow, uh, which tells me I'm on track. So I don't know how your spirits will work with you. They work with me like that. Our world is about balance, just like we have the living, helping spirits. We also have negative spirits. That's why ancestral healing is so important. Our primary foe spirit is Osar's youngest brother, which is set the lower nature, the ancestors that were living in their lower nature. So just like Osar, Osar is accompanied by Bolivian Aku, who are helping spirits that are all that are that are associated with the deep mind. Again, we go back to our psychology, we go back to our mind. The superconscious higher self or ba set because of his envious, violent, chaotic, etc. actions and behaviors became the immortalized as the primary foe spirit who corresponds to the lower self. I just said that. The subconscious or sahu with the malivian spirits. Most people call malivian or foe spirits demons, but they are spirits who, who have chosen to stay in the same rut. So you'll have some ancestors that are not involved, evolved, and they just stay there. That is why we come in contact with Bolivian ancestors to pray for them and to guide them. False spirits have died violently or through suicide. Most false spirits are chaotic, confused, misguided, like psychotic human beings. They offer no constructive advice or suggest suggestion that can prove that could improve the life of living. Instead, they encourage the living to follow the same unwise, destructive path. You see what I'm saying? That karmic loop. They, you have your ancestors literally haunting you that they followed when they were alive. For instance, if these spirits, when alive, were involved in criminal activities, they will continue to inspire others to take the same path they took, knowing it leads nowhere. Okay, so you saw it there. Let me move on. There's a lot of stuff in this book. How do you know you are being guided by Bolivian spirits? When we follow Bolivian spirits, they usually speak through the intuition. This is why he, doing that healing work is so important of our body and discourage us from following our ego. Our primary Aku makes connections and uses his influences to intercede on our behalf, similar to how Osar interceded on Hiru's behalf. Our primary Akhu acts as a lawyer by searching for the best deals that will encourage spiritual growth. See, they're going to come for your highest good. They're going to find things for uh, solutions and options for your highest good. Whenever we're experiencing hardships, having problems, experiencing any type of setbacks, etc., we can always reach out to the primary Akhu, who will connect us to our Akhu ancestral spirits and spirit guides. Together, they will influence situations that lead us away from accidents, disturbances, bumps into you, thus causing you to miss being hit by a vehicle cause you to be in the right place at the right time for opportunities to fall in your lap 
or give us the inspiration we need to complete a project that will result in us being prosperous. How do you know you are being blinded by false spirits? That's pretty easy. Again, if you still carrying these lower vibrational energies from your family, like I said, these personalities, all this other stuff that you, you haven't healed it or whatever, that's an indication. Like I tell you, all this stuff, it goes together. It goes together. You can't have one without the other. When we follow our set, which is our lower self, who speaks to our soul, who, like you heard, you see it right there, lower self subconscious before I even said it. Every egocentric impulse, every negative action and behavior, every malicious word, every vicious action, every time we act out of anger, guilt, shame, fear, and jealousy, Every time we are scornful, disrespectful, nasty, vindictive, malicious, and spiteful, every time we swindle, deceive, cheat, etc., our set attracts negative spirits called at people to create, to create chaos, havoc, and destruction. So those of you that want to work with this chaos energy, that's what you're working with. The Lord self. I always say, oh, people say, I love working with chaos energy. Really? You can't control chaos. You have, you have no way to tell how that's going to result. You can set the intentions and then do something else. Together, set with a people causes miscommunication between people in order to break up relationships. They hide keys and other things of importance that cover your eyes and create blind spots, causing you to miss the car in the other lane and have an accident. They confuse messages resulting in arguments and fights and other mishaps. That's what happens there. Why do we need helping spirits? According to the Ma'ak Cosmogram, when we are born, we all pass through a veil of nylon, the Kephra moment. When we are born, most of our memories of our past lives are true, our true God-like nature, and the reason we are here is erased. Just in case you are wondering why our memories are erased prior to our arrival, it is because if we knew about our divine nature and knew who who we were and knew our purpose, we would know the future and we would not be able to achieve our goal of achieving fulfillment. For instance, if you knew that there is a possibility that you may break your leg by learning how to ride a bike, would you still learn how to uh, learn the skill? Most people would not because most people try to avoid falling at all costs without understanding that the purpose of falling is so that you don't know how to stand back up. So since we, the living, do not remember our purpose, our helping spirits who are still on the other side of the nyan line can assist us because they can see and remember everything. As a result, these spirits will help us achieve goals that, that are in alignment with our true purpose. They accomplish this by communicating to us intuitively because our helping spirits have been selected by our primary Aku, and they reside in Kanta. They have the tendency to send us flashes of intuitive insight. And then I tell you how they will flash things in your mind that you can see. This guy, he, he's confirming everything I said before I even read this. So if you're not doing the healing, you're going to keep on getting some miscommunication. This is why this is important. It's all twofold uh, thing. Flashes correspond to the whiteness of Osar hedged crown. Many times these thoughts that appear to come out of nowhere, did not say they come out of nowhere, provide helpful clues on what we should do. A lot of times these thoughts that sound like voices in our heads such as slow down, she is cheating on you, or so on, are ignored because we we may not like what is being said, but our helping spirits are now here to sugarcoat. That's what I get people readings. I can't sugarcoat. 
but to help us achieve our purpose when messages are received, it is best to pick up on the clues and surrender. This all encompasses shamanic work. This is conjure work. This is how you will communicate with your ancestors. This is basic information here. Now he is working with the, the, the comedic pathanon. There's nothing wrong with that. It's still our ancestors. And in hoodoo, you'll find yourself working with a variety of, of ancestral spirits. That's why I love hoodoo. It's not just set to one thing. Wherever that ancestor is, if that ancestor is in a comedic pathanon, you can work with that. If that ancestor is in the Catholic pathanon, working with saints, you can work with that. That's why I like hoodoo so much. It's such a variety of uh, ancestral medicine to choose from. There are several ways that spirits will try to communicate with us, and below are some of the most common ways. Animals, all the Neturu have totem animals that are associated with them and the spirits that walk with them will use them to communicate messages to you. So when you go out on nature and you're trying to communicate with ancestors, pay attention to those animals that you're seeing because the spirit is communicating with you. If you're performing a ritual and you see one of these animals, it is confirmation that they got the message and are on the job. If you are not doing a ritual and you see one of the nectar animals, you need to pay attention to your thoughts and how you feel immediately after seeing it. Salehe. Salehe in Spanish it is said to be a small clouds or color clouds, but spiritually speaking, it refers to the shadows that we see out of the corners of, of our eyes. In Cuba, Puerto Rico is usually interpreted as an auspicious sign that your spirits are near. Now, I remember my mom going uh, over and over with me saying that she was seeing spirits in the corner of her eyes. This was one was of the last, what, 20 years she would say that. I see spirits and I see stuff out the corner of my eyes. Dreams. One of the most common ways spirits communicate to us is through our dreams because we are relaxed state of mind. Remember, our Ba cannot give us creative ideas when we are tense. That's why when you go into a shamanic journey, you need to let go. So many spirits will visit us when we are asleep and give us messages. When you receive messages in your dreams, the key is to interpreting them to review how, to, how it makes you feel. For instance, a recurrent theme that appears in your dream is me being chased by zombies. Zombies are my spirits way of reminding me, me old and useless habits. I have also found that spirits will also send you a message as visions while taking showers, washing dishes, or performing some other mindless task. When your mind is daydreaming, they will step in there as happened to me. Hearing your name, hearing your name called, no one is around. I had that happen to me. I remember when I first got into uh, reading, I was reading about Kabbalah and the spirit was talking to me in my mind clairaudiently because I hear clairaudiently and I kept ignoring it. And then when I and my uh, ex-husband got in the bed to lay down, he heard the name, he heard my name being called. It, it, it alarmed both of us. He went around the whole house, checking the whole house just to see did someone break into the home. But I knew it was not. I knew it was my spirit. But at this time, I wasn't that advanced on my spiritual journey. I was only doing uh, a lot of reading stuff, trying to figure out how my spiritual gifts work. And it worked at night. One common belief is that when you, you hear your name called in a negative spirit, that is trying to misguide you like a legendary Greek siren. The mines wasn't called like that. It was like penny, penny, you know, just like that. The old folk belief of whistling in the house or when no one is around is based upon the belief that you are trying to get spirit's attention. For that matter, any spirit, believing or malevolent, is liable to answer. So do not, they say, do not whistle. Whistle. 
insects. I have found that some ancestral spirits will use insects. For instance, when my wife's mom passed away several months later, we kept seeing her favorite insects, ladybugs. I see them a lot. Now I'm seeing one or two. Okay, you guys, I'm sorry I didn't make the, we need to make this video that long, but there, like, he is so much good information in here, and I don't want to miss anything for you. Uh, this book is worth reading, especially if you're if you are one to follow a comedic uh, spiritual path and on. This this is good for that. But it, it, even if you just want to get basic information about how to uh, a shamanic spiritual practice communicating with the ancestors, it's good for that. Like, this is where it is. I'm emphasizing this because this is where it is, and this is this where it gets so dismissed. This is a lot of information that's being kept away from you when you go into initiations and stuff like this. This is where you're going to find this information. This is where you're going to find it because this has to be done before you, you know, before you even start progressing and growing. That's why I'm going into this. Yeah, you know, folks teaching you about spell work. They're teaching you how to build an ancestor altar. They're teaching you all of that. But the big thing that you need to learn is not being uh, provided for you. And I'm trying to provide this to you right now so you'll understand it. Okay, so let me move on. Uh, we were talking about ladybugs. Some other insects that spirit seems to be fond of communicating is with butterflies and dragonflies. I, I was seeing a lot of dragonflies uh, as well. When I first started healing, I started seeing a lot of butterflies. Music often, music, often when we hear music that reminds us of someone from the past, this is a sign that a spirit is trying to communicate with us. Sometimes spirits will keep playing a song in your mind continuously called earworms. Have you ever heard this song? Just, uh, what was the song I used to, used to sing? It was a song I sing all the time, and I, re I already knew that it was my spirit guide that was putting the song in my head. Other times, you may just turn on the radio and hear music from a passing vehicle. If any of these songs remind you of someone who passed, it is important that you pay attention to the lyrics and how the song makes you feel. Moving objects, chill out. I'm not talking about actual floating in the air, uh, you know, like they do in the Harvard story. No, spirits do have habits of moving things. If you get an urge to move something because it seems or feels better, this is most likely the inspiration from the spirit. I say this about on your altar. I always set your altar up to what feels good to you. Because what I find, I'm always moving stuff on that on that altar, and it's usually spirit that's moving it. Because it's it's going to be more conducive for that altar. So I always trust when you're putting stuff together. Because I have moved some sometime and forgot about it, and it wasn't really me that moving. It was spirit that moved it because it was not supposed to be there. You will find stuff that you don't even remember moving. But then you go back to see it in its right place where it should have been. I get I get that done to me all the time. I remember when my grandfather passed away, I felt like he wanted his photo on my nut pool uh, altar. So I placed it, his photo there. After a month or so, he wanted to be moved to my ancestral altar, which is where he has been ever since. As far as I can tell, my grandfather did not know anything about in pool. He was a Freemason, but as far as I can figure, he wanted to be moved to Nimpu's head, head because Nimpu is a crossroad and a gateway spirit that leads the dead to uh, their new role. Okay? Negative spirits move things as well. Remember Set, blinded hero, resulted in him not seeing the obvious? Have you ever laid something down like your keys, money, important papers, etc., somewhere, and when you went back, to, you could not find them? Then later, you either find them in the exact location or somewhere you did not go. 
This is the work of set. I would say it's always the work of set. Sometimes your ancestors would, will, will uh, move stuff. It don't mean they're negative spirits. You know, I disagree there, but sometimes they'll have you move stuff. You know, they might tell you, move in the other line. I've been driving, and they say, get in the other line. I get in the other line, and here I am. I've avoided a wreck, an accident of somebody, you know, running into me. So those are signs as well. So it's not always negative. Confusion in some culture, it is believed to be the spirits of witches. Numbers, have you ever looked at the clock and uh, and seems as if it has stopped or you wake up at the particular time to see a particular time? For instance, sometimes I happen to pass by my room and the clock is 111, which equals to three. I usually interpret this as a sign from my nephews. Nephews number is three because the number is 11 thus it is a warning sign informing me to be cautious understand there's no right or wrong way to interpret a number numerical signs it all depends upon how particular numbers makes you feel based upon your experience they play with electricity we already know that i've heard of spirits playing with electricity but in my experience it is usually been negative that do this for instance they will cause a light bulb to blow out in order to start you as far as i can tell negative spirits get a little energy from doing this when this occurs it is a clear sign that you need to do cleanse your space and this may be different for you you might talk to your spirits through lights since, and since are in hands, do you feel a light brushing on your hand or arm? Do you smell fragrances or perfumes that remind you of someone who has passed away? These are signs that spirits are near you. I've had that happen to me so many times. So many times. There are signs that spirits are near you. Other signs involving your physical senses are an intense temporary ringing in your ear, which is believed by many to be signs the information is being downloaded from your bot into your sahu, hence processing a request. Another sign, your, your sense being enhanced in a famous spidey sense. This is where you feel like someone is planting your hair or head tingling. I have that during meditation when I'm getting downloads. Synchronicities, you're going to see a lot of those. Those, you're going to see a lot of those. Spirits can give us all sorts of signs, but sometimes they can cause two or more events to occur. They are highly unlikely to occur by chance in very in a very meaningful way. For instance, have you ever thought about a family member or a friend, and then suddenly they call, receive a message from them, which has, has you saying, I was just thinking about you, besides revealing that they were connected one way spirits getting us to see that we are on the onto something thoughts thoughts are important intellectual spirits have the tendency to share messages to us by appearing as thoughts and ideas in our head you may get a thought or an idea that reminds you of something a relative did when they were alive for instance i once were reminded how during my family reunions as a child, my brother's cousins and I had to take turns turning the ice cream. I can remember doing that when I was a little girl. We had to take turn, turns turning that ice cream maker. Hours later, we all were able to enjoy homemade ice cream, but the image and the thought that popped in my mind was a reminder of how we, my family, worked together. It was a reminder that we need to continue to do the same in the future. So these are a, are a variety of ways that your your ancestors will try to connect with you but if you really want a a visual and visit them in a safe way go to the astral realm who is considered helping spirits of the aku since osar chooses the aku who will assist us in life as you can imagine there are a lot of aku that exist in previous books 
I have mentioned that we all have a variety of Aku. For instance, some of these spirits will inspire us using history, while others will inspire us through religion, etc. Further investigations have led me to discover that these spirits are basically our spiritual DNA. Did not tell you that they are in you. First, it must be understood that we all have ancestry that goes back to the beginning of time. And when the first uh, ancestors walked the planet, to get technical, we have many ancestors as we have cells within our body. All of these ancestral spirits contribute to our behavior, how we act, talk, and speak, etc. But they do not all play a major role in our life. There is only a handful of act who, who have been chosen to walk with us in this lifetime. Some, uh, some of these act who have been with us since birth while others come into our life for a brief moment to get us to move in a specific direction. Some act who have a stronger influence on us so, so than others do. While we all may share a common act who, who ties us all together. Since, it's, since it is our actions and behaviors that attracts or repels spirits to us, we bump shoulders with many Aku that are found in places of nature or places of power, like in the woods, forests, crossroads, front, front or back door, etc. And for this reason, the Aku are closely associated with certain ne nectar guardian spirits like Nimpu. However, the Aku, because of the heroic deeds, can be called upon by remembering their unique story like Harriet Tubman, who can steal free people as she had done in the Underground Railroad, or Black Hawk, the South leader who fought against government oppression. Again, he is coming, he's going back into that, like showing you, he just went into hoodoo. You see how he just went into hoodoo? These are some of the deities that we, we run and some of our ancestors. You got the primary Aku, who are ancestral spirits who speak to us through our ba, our super conscious, our higher consciousness. These are the most angelic ancestors. These spirits are usually associated with nectar, osar, and accompany us in life from birth. These are like guardian angels, angelic beings. They are responsible for organizing events and gathering the various aku who will assist us in life. Then you got the bad biological. These are the ones you have to work on and pick the garden and heal from. Our ancestral spirits who are related to us by blood. These Aku are usually associated with nectar, or set, and have a strong sense of family. Biological Aku are typically very concerned with maintaining tradition for the benefit of the family clan. Although immediate family ancestral spirits are included in this group, most of these are distant ancestral spirits whom most of us would not remember. Then we have the historical Aku, our ancestral spirits that have made contributions like Malcolm X, Harriet Tubman, Dr. Martin Luther King. You got those too. So you have a variety of ancestors. I think I talked about that in uh, the types of ancestors video. It should be noted that any of the helper Aku can become from different cultures for the reason they are known as culture Aku. Culture Aku usually are not related to us, but for some reason they agree to assist us in our growth. For instance, you could not be an Asian war Aku who walks with a, a hero Akahuti. If you are trying to master Asian martial arts like karate, taekwondo, etc., you could have an African mystical Aku who inspires you to purchase an African figurine placed next to a Mayot because they want to assist you in divination. It is possible to have Native American Sweetwater Aku that inspires you. However, there are two Aku that people of African descent in America all have. They all throughout the African diaspora, Los Negros, Petro Felhos, and La Madama and El Congo in North America. The female archetype of Aku is known as Mama or Auntie, and her male counterpart is known as Papa 
a uncle. You'll see Papa Legba. You see how he just went into that? Because that's part of our culture. That's part of our ancestral culture. Before explaining who and what these Aku are, why they are unique, I must first state that there is a lot of misunderstanding about the two spirits, particularly La Madama, because of the cultural appropriation. The other part is due to lack of understanding, so I decided to put my two cents in. And then he goes on here to kind of talk about uh, Santeria, the Caribbean spirits, uh, the tradition of La Nabama, uh, is the spirit of the Black Cuban and Black Puerto Rican woman who was most likely a Palera, a female practi practitioner of Palo Mayambe, aka Regla de Congo or Santeria. La, La Damas are therefore the spirits of the dead who were enslaved women who typically were depicted as house servants wearing a gigam, gigam skirt or apron and a headscarf. You see how that those are tied to our ancestors? I'm breaking it down for you here. And what is this? He is practicing shamanism. This is where it's at too. Hoodoo is a is a form of shamanism. Okay, so he goes into that in details. How do we connect with the spirits? And I'm gonna close it from here. I'm on the. I, I, this is page eighty nine. Like I said, this is a great book. There's a lot of juicy stuff in here. There's a lot of takeaways in this uh, book. You know, especially when he talks about how he communes with his ancestors and how he does his offerings. Some of who stay with us for a short period of time while others stay with us for all our life because of soul connection. Some of who help you to overcome certain issues that are going on in your life and when you understand the lesson you will leave they will leave some of these spirits if you do not have a strong head will lead you into their world and rescue you just in the nick of time for instance a lot of young people are still influenced by the deceased rapper tupac because he helped them to rise above certain obstacles they face in their life in regards to police brutality and other social ills. Some of them follow in Tupac's footsteps with similar consequences, but they all consider him a guide who helped those in the underworld. Okay, it was it was the deceased rapper Old Dirty Bastard of Wu Tang who helped me to rise above certain grimy situations. At one point of my life. But anyone who knows about ODB knows that he was really into some strong drugs. Listening to his music will catapult me into that world. Thankfully, I learned the lesson I needed from him too, from him. So I have no need to venture down that path. Every now and then he will pop up and I will hear one of his songs in my ears and OD, ODB would come to town signifying me to watch out, be on my toes, and protect my neck. This is Akhu was associated with my historical Akhu. So again, knowing the more you know about you, how your mind relates to the world around you, and how your mind communicate with the ancestors are going to be important. How do the helping spirits Akhu assist us? There are many ways that the Akhu can help us because unlike other spirit traditions and religions that usually requires one adopts and change their beliefs in order to succeed in the hierarchy of the tradition. Our Akhu accept us for who we are. They love us regardless. They do not care what we believe or do so long as they like, el like elder family members are cared for, care for them, and they will care for you. However, they can be a bit demanding. That's why I tell people, you erect these altar, especially to these other deities, it takes work. You deserve them. <clears throat> it's a way of life. 
So if you're not in it, you know, to heal and make it a part of your daily life, don't do it. If they had certain ethics and principles they live by, they expect you to live by those same ethics and principles as well, because it was their ethics and principles that made it possible for you to be here today. So that character work is going to be important. It is true that some traditions become outdated, useless due to changing times, therefore obsolete. However, this does not mean the ancestral traditions are obsolete. You hear it? Many people believe that they can live by, they can live any kind of way. And it is true. You have the right to live your life as you want to. But if you want blessings from the Aku, your ancestors, you have to not live a righteous life. Did you hear it there? Certain things you can't do. You cannot do. Stop watching the TV shows and looking at what these folks doing because you cannot do what these folks are doing. They're doing that for a reason. Okay? They're doing that to trick you. Many of us, how do you talk to your spirits? Many of us come from religious background, have been taught to pray every time we need a spiritual blessing. But what I have found is that this is not necessary. Our spirits are our spirits. They know us. They know what we do, who we are. So I personally do not see a need to be formal. Out of respect and to set the mood, I may say the Lord's Prayer, which I do say. But other than that, I do not really believe in praying to my ancestors. Praying always reminds me of when I was a teenager at church begging and tearing for the Holy Ghost to descend upon me. I do not believe that my that that I am worthy, that my spirits think I am worthy. So I do not need to beg for anything. I respectfully talk to my spirit just like I would talk to my friend. That's how you would talk to them. Spirits are at a vantage point because they do not have a physical body and are therefore are not bound by time and space. However, the living, we have vantage over them because we have a physical body which gives us the ability to experience life. In other words, spirits are not superior to you, but at the same time, we are not superior over them. We both have something to gain from each other, which is why the relationship with spirits is more, more like a partnership if you, you keep in mind instead of thinking of them being your be as being your superiors. Superiors, you will have a very powerful experience. Talk to your spirits. Remember that most spirit guys were once upon a time people, so they have likes and dislikes. When you call up on your spirits, uh, you may or may not uh, establish a report immediately. But because you may be doing something, they might find offensive. Second, for the reason, choose a work with a uh, choose to work with the spirit. You need to read that spirit story. You need to know their story. This can help you avoid trickster spirits. Last but not least, always be skeptical about what the spirits tell you. Bolivian spirits understand that just like you would not trust a stranger off the street with your life, you are not expected to trust spirits the same way without building a rapport. So test. That's why I go back and test my knowledge. I test what they tell me in meditation. I do research on it. And I'd be like, wow, there it is. Or later on, I find a book on it. Okay. I'm getting ready to wrap this up. I know it is a lot, uh, and I'm sorry about that. I, I truly am. How many minutes are we into this? I don't know how many minutes we are into this, but I'm going to wrap it up for you guys. Last but not least, always be skeptical. You no know, Test the spirits. You can do that with divination. You can do that by research. Always go into meditation and ask them something uh scientific you know or i wonder about something and usually they will tell me they will give me something where i can research it test them they'll give you the knowledge where you can research it and they'll start having you to run into information on the subject 
ancestral curses and generational problems. If you were not raised in the culture that venerates ancestors, it is usually difficult for you to comprehend how or why your ancestors would trouble you. You would spend a lot of time trying to intellectually comprehend this entire concept and the whole concept regarding spirit, the spiritual realm. We have to remember that we are not just thinking of being, thinking beings, but feeling beings. Okay, so you'll see in there if there's curses and problems, the family have the same similar problem. You know, you'll have, there'll be a lot of uh, women unmarried, there'll be alcoholism, addiction going on there, some type of substance abuse. Uh, there'll be some type of physical illness that's going on there. Uh, criminal activity, which I've went over there. If there are some issues going on, uh, mothers not getting along, uh, there's a lot of gossiping about each other in there. There's something going on there. Okay. Uh, another thing that I thought that was good, because I've always said that, if you want to get a good handle on this too, and I find that it was good to research is uh, that spiritism, that Cuban spiritism is a good thing to research too, to learn more about how to communicate with spirits. But I'm going to be going through another book that tells you too uh, how conjure really works. But this, I wanted you to really understand shamanism and how it all uh, comes together. Okay, so I'm not going to keep you long here. Uh, I like here that he talks about it was my recovery that decided to fully adopt the Espertizo Mo Cruzado format because it was the only format to help him remember the Osar, our Osar wrists at our right shoulder and set on the left shoulder. So he went in and he adopted some of this. Um, and you'll see that with the Hispanics, they have their own form of spiritism. And it works. It works just it's, it's, it's just as effective because you got to remember that those Cubans and those Hispanics, their ancestors, they were dark skinned people. And so a lot of this was pa passed on to them. So you can learn a lot uh, from them venerating their ancestors, too. They have a lot of the uh, knowledge that's not been touched. So you see here he talks about the symbolizing the nine guardians of Kemet the way you can set up glasses of waters, and there's still people that use this format today, especially when you're doing a novena. You'll find, you'll find a lot of those Catholic practices, you can use a lot of them in your work because a lot of them, again, it comes from us. They just, they took it over and modified it. Did you see how he set that up? This is the basic glass set up, and he shows you the glass set up for attack. And he shows you the, uh, the glass set up for defense. That's how he does it on his altar. I like this because it, it, it's showing you, he's giving you great details. And we still use this today, whether we're in uh, practicing commit or just, you know, honoring our ancestors. I know a lot of people that use this format, especially when they're doing healing work. And then he tells you here, he shows you here how to set up an altar. See how he has it set up? You would need a huge altar for all of this. You would need a, a, a big, huge altar. So if your altar is not that huge, you can start with one glass of water. But if you're trying to do a novena, a healing, I do recommend uh, using the, the, uh, the nine glasses. Okay. So uh, I hope you found this beneficial. And I didn't even cover everything in this book. Like it's so much juicy stuff in this book. I found. I hope you found this um, video helpful. I hope you found it insightful that it gave you a foundation to work with. And I will be coming back here 
more with about shamanism and path working. But I want to give you as much information as possible so you can understand how you can incorporate that in your spiritual practices and help you understand this is a way of life. This is no fly by put down thing. Okay, beloved, we covered a lot in that book, Accounta. We covered a lot. Like I told you, it's a really good book. Uh, I recommend you read it. You know, take the uh, parts in there that work for you. There certainly is a lot of spiritual gems in that book. And uh, I wanted to share that with you to give you a solid foundation to work with your ancestors and tell you what you should be looking at to strengthen that connection with them. But I'll be coming here with more information about it. I'll be coming here with more information about how to work, uh, how to, how to uh, uh, work with shamanism, what is exactly shamanism is, and how to do path working, because that's what we're going to work on, doing that path working, adjusting your meditations to where you can meet with your ancestors. So that's what I'm going to be talking about and uh, in the next video. Mm, thank you for being here with me today. And I hope this video was insightful. And, uh, you know, what do you want to hear? What do you think about this video? Put it in the comments. I want to know what you think, what jumped out at you, uh, and what, did you, what were your takeaways from this video? Thanks for being here with me today. Light, love, namaste, ashe, loved one.